Dr. Murray. Long well, after credit. <laughs> uh huh. Oh, okay. I'm going to do the longer. <laughs> Was as bad as the week after I got my hunting license, I went through the went through the washing machine. So <laughs> throw it throw it on the wood stove and I'll dry out. Sure. Just had to re-sign some signatures. Is that the one you're not? Yeah, the one I thought I had in the pocket. Wait, Wait is this a ball? Okay, I'll spray. At least you found it. Oh, I can't find my uh, my uh, question to put back Mooney, so will paper suffice? Nope. Get you another thing. I'm like, I'm sorry, I should be ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I can't. I've already been six times. I've been moved by my daughter's dad. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to save my life. Thank you. There's also a plan for you, too. Mm -hmm. I believe that's for your VIP day. Did I give you one already? According to my records, I hadn't given it to you. Thank you. Okay, so where are we? We are here. Fabulous. 102 Marshall. Um, why is that responding? So lecture 24, last questions. Also, an opportunity um, for extra credit if anybody wants it. Um, Friday at 11 and Saturday at 11, we are meeting, I think it's 101 with accepted students. If you can come and provide a perspective, answer the students' questions, that is uh, generally pretty helpful. So. Yeah, tomorrow and Saturday, I believe at 11. I probably should double check that. But, um, do you have to do one or the other? Do you have to do both? You can do either one, both, neither. Just we need students. It's helpful. Um, so whatever works best with your schedule or not, as the case may be. I would imagine there'll be other extra credit opportunities given how crazy things are about to get. So we got 11 due now, 12 is posted. Um, review sessions, um, still Mondays. I'll probably go through uh, Monday of finals week. Uh, the seventh right now is when our final is scheduled. Um, I will confirm that, I think the official schedule comes out tomorrow but what i said was i i was fine with the scheduled time tuesday yes tuesday i guess i can put that in there to 
make things a little clearer. My mom's birthday, so sorry, mom. I have a final to give. <laughs> but she want me to leave and go and <laughs> take care of her. Um, let's see. So we're covering there with the review sessions coming up for that exam. Do you want me to pick specific topics? Or are you still good with you come in with your questions? OK, so we'll schedule what we'll cover each night there. Um, going back through, so trying to get caught up on your. Um, homework so we can get that figured out, taken care of. Um, so where your strengths, where your weaknesses are. Um, Probably the 14th one. So this one will be due, what, the last week of classes. This will probably be a bonus one that you can turn in or not. So if you turn it in, it'll count as a free assignment. So if we have 13, if you turn in all 13, add the 14, your assign written assignments will be 14 over 13. So it'll give you. 8% on that or something like that. That's the way we usually do it. So um, you don't have to turn it in. It is recommended that you go through it because there we'll pull questions from there. But um, so where are we? So any questions, um, written assignments? I think I got nine or 10 back to most of you. You're shooting for twos. Anything related to question seven? Do you want me to go through it or not? Time exam two, do you want me to go through it at all? As per usual, the score I have in on the the score on the back is the one I have in the spreadsheet that I use for grading. So that adds up all of the points. I total up the the numbers at the bottom of the page. I enter the bottom corner numbers. And then it divides through by the total number. So certainly check the math. Make sure I totaled all the points correctly on that page. Anybody want to go back through? So. OK, so moving on. So any drawbacks to BST? From a cow perspective, probably other than the needle stick, there's probably no problems. Um, there's uh, from a health perspective, from a FDA approval perspective, it is the most tested drug ever. There's been more research behind it, showing things that the only real, only close to a difference on um, the submissions was there was a trend towards a difference in somatic cell where the, what is it, the somatic, somatic cell on animals that were treated was 250,000 versus the ones that were not treated was 220. So a difference of 30,000. For those of you who studied the range in somatic cell, is 30,000 anything? Um, not really. You got one cow spike in the tank, you'll get that 30,000 difference. So one cow in a herd can change the tank test um, that much. Um, but the animal rights groups uh, jumped on that and said, we're producing pus. Anybody in this room have objections to doing somatic cell milk of 250,000? So it's pretty much what you're getting in the store. So, but there was, oh, it's pus. It's all pus. Like, no, the cows are not giving custard. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at somatic cell counts of 9 million, that's when we get that cheese coming out. So way different. So drawbacks. Um, I had a discussion. Um, my mom married into a, a family, a big Italian family, and then one of the brothers was a mechanic. And he was called God in the neighborhood because he could fix anything. 
<laughs> so I was in grad school at the time. I had to go. Um, I had a, a sensor issue and I had to get back. So I went down to his shop. He squeezed me in. And because of family, I could go in the shop and talk to him. So we have a very smart individual, really good at mechanics, kind of worldly. And while we're standing there, he goes, so what about this BST stuff? He says, what do you want to know? And he goes, is it dangerous? It's like, no. Does it hurt kids? No. So and then you talk about it. We'll get to this next week. But BST is a protein hormone. What happens to a protein hormone when it goes into your digestive tract? Broken down to amino acids. It's not a hormone anymore. It's not like a steroid that gets absorbed no matter where. So if BST is in the milk, BST has always been in the milk. It's treated like any other protein. What if I took Pozolac and I injected it into me? Other than hurting, it would do absolutely nothing. Because BST, the form that's in the cow, the small b, somatotropin, does not work in humans. They say it doesn't go up the evolutionary ladder. So human BST will work in cows. Bovine somatotropin BST growth hormone will not work in humans. So there's a whole lot of layers where it's not going to influence anything. So and he goes, oh. And it kind of surprised me because this raid, the thing had been raging on for probably 10 years at the time. He's a very smart man, and he hadn't formed an opinion on it yet, which kind of surprised me. So we had our discussion. He goes, so my kids can drink it? It's like, yeah, it's wrong. So again, it's the most studied hormone product ever put through FDA approval. And that's probably because, you know, it's easier to get cows as test subjects than humans. Um, that and just the process of what you're dealing with, you can inject it in your body, it will not do anything. It'll eventually be absorbed and digested in the liver and broken down and the liver will recycle the amino acids. How does lactose get made? What's the process? So we're speaking very broadly and that's because I only know very broadly. So the mammary gland absorbs two glucoses. It'll take one glucose as is. It'll take the other glucose and isomerize it. So galactose is an isomer of glucose. Same number of carbons, just a different arrangement. So um, when you're looking at it, so it'll isomerize it. It'll switch one carbon. It'll put the, it'll basically rotate it and then put it back to, uh, together. Um, those two glucoses are stuck together. That forms galactose. The galactose glucose form lactose. So what do we know about lactose being put out into the alveolus of the uh, mammary gland? That's going to draw water. It's osmotically active. So putting that out into the lumen makes that area um, hypertonic. So water's going to rush in that direction to equal things out, which is why if you have lactose intolerance, that causes uncomfortable digestive issues. So we as mammals normally lose the ability to digest lactose as we get older because we are not supposed to be drinking milk, at least in theory, in the wild anymore. That's for babies. So if you can't digest lactose, you can't split it into the two components, glucose and galactose, that get absorbed into the body. They just sit there in the lumen of the intestines, the opening of the intestines, what happens? They're still osmotic active they draw water into the gut and socially uncomfortable things happen <laughs> especially if you're far away from a bathroom so <laughs> so 
Normally that stuff gets divided. The solutes are now in the body. Water's gonna follow solute, but if they remain in the gut, water's gonna follow solute the other way and in a way we don't want it to. So having that enzyme is key. Um, is a cow more likely to get ketosis again once it got it the first time? I doubt they're necessarily related, but it's probably a function of their metabolism. What are they good at? What are they not good at? So if they have a predisposition to being faulty for certain parts or predisposition to being fat, that might make them more predisposed. But I don't think it, because you had it once, you've worn a groove that makes it likely to happen again. I guess most of you don't know about skipping records, right? None of you have any experience with vinyl. So once you get that skip going and it stays in there, it tends to reroute through. But ketosis itself does not predispose to ketosis, but an animal that got it probably has the same uh, set points and genetics that might set it up again. That's my take on that. So where are we? We're going to talk about the nervous, we'll finish up metabolism, talk about the nervous system, then move on to the endocrine system. Any questions or concerns? It's the nervous system. <laughs> so get out your letters. See how we're doing with our metabolism. Based on what we discussed, mitochondria require what to do work or what to work. A, carbon dioxide. B, three carbon units to burn. Three, three carbon units for gluconeogenesis or D, oxygen. So D. E oxygen, so carbon dioxide is an output. We need two units to burn, and gluconeogenesis has nothing to do with mitochondria. So if we take a look at our three fatty acids, what can we do with them? Or what does the cow do with them? So if we start with acetate or acetic acid, can the cow oxidize it to carbon dioxide and water and energy? turn it into glucose, turn it into a fatty acid for a triglyceride, or turn it into glycerol for a triglyceride? So oxidize it. Definitely, right? It's a big energy source especially for the liver to run and do all it needs to do. Turn it into glucose. No, never. We need to be a three carbon unit and we can't get acetate in there. Turn it into a fatty acid and a triglyceride. Yes, we put those two by two together. Acetate is the preferred substrate in a cow for making those fatty acids which is why almost all the fatty acids in the triglycerides in the milk are even numbered. It's rare that you get an odd numbered one. Glycerol in a triglyceride? No. So it's the same thing, acetate can't get a glucose or glycerol. Propionate. What does the cow do with propionate? So the main thing is it turns it into glucose, right? That's the main source of glucose in the body. Because it's a three carbon unit, we can make it into glycerol. It could, in theory, go the other routes, but the set points in the body tend to keep propionate away from those two options because it is so valuable for making glucose. Butyrate. 
same options. What we talked about in class is the main oxidation. It helps run the gut. It definitely can't become glucose. It definitely can't become glycerol. There are instances where it might end up in a fatty acid. That's if it happens to be floating around, but most of it gets burned up by the gut. So we talked last time about figuring out a cow's body weight. So we can take a... Um, We can think about a bar chart for her body weight. So most of her body weight is accounted for here. We've got the GI contents. Could be on some of our bigger cows as much as 400 pounds. Butter fill before and after milking. How much do we extract? There's some cows that are 10, 20. There are other cows at the dairy we're pulling out 50 pounds for milking. And then we're dealing with the hypertrophied uterus, the fluids around that calf and the calf itself. You're probably looking at 200 pounds. So empty body weight, we talked about last time. This is pretty light. So this is probably standard for dairy. You guys measured that yesterday. We were what, 1,500 pounds, somewhere in there. So empty body weight's probably around 1,200. So not accounting for those other things. And as that body condition goes up, we increase in the proportion of fat in each body condition score. At least this is what the 2001 said. The 2021 said, well, maybe not. But at least from my experience looking at the cows, there's probably a lot more fat tissue in that last body condition score up here. Um, than there is in that first. So we're putting on muscle first, faster than fat. And as we move up, get these animals to that five, that ball of fat with a tail in it, we're putting on more fat than we are protein as we make that last step. So we talked about the mega calories. So we got some differences in mega calories. This body condition score has 375. If we take off a five to a four, she's going to have, what, 25 plus 32, 57 more megacalories. So, and that has to do with fat has more usable calories per gram than carbohydrate or protein. So, if we look at milk production, we can probably get... 12, 1,500 pounds for uh, a fat corrected, 4% fat corrected milk out of that body condition. So if we're looking at where that occurs, that's going to be in the front of lactation. So if we've got lactation curve with days down here, days in milk, pounds of milk, that body condition is going to be there because we're dropping body condition in early lactation. It's going to go toward milk. She's going to try to feed her calf. So thin cows are much easier to manage than um, fat cows. Nothing good comes from a fat cow. Um, used to be back in the 50s and 60s, get them as fat as you can. 
And then you're going to produce more butter fat and you're going to get paid more. But what were they having? They were dumping all that fat directly into the milk, elevated milk fats associated with ketosis. So that was probably not the way to go. So you've got that there. So when we're looking at uh, management in our cows, we need to remember that the next pound of intake is probably the most profitable. If I can get one more pound of intake, five more pounds of intake, I've taken care of all the other needs for nutrition, at least in theory. She's paid for her maintenance. She's paid for her growth. She's paid for her reproduction, maybe. But last pound intake can go to all milk. So if we look at that, if we assume a high cow ration is 0.8 megacals per pound of dry matter, great pasture is going to be in that same ballpark, 0.75 megacalories per pound. Assuming that we're producing 4 ohm fat, that's going to require a third of a megacalorie. If we want to produce one pound of 3O fat, that's going to require 0.28 megacalories. So given that pound of intake up here, and this is how much each pound of milk is, we can get at least two pounds, possibly three, from that additional pound of intake. So we're conservative when we're trying to put together partial budgets. We'll say two pounds. If we're being optimistic, we might say three. Trying to sell a point in some way. So dividing how much is in a make calories in a pound by the need for milk production gives us that two to three pounds. So up to three pounds. So if we're looking at our energy balance, so first part of lactation, a cow is putting out more than she consumes. We tend to think about energy, negative energy balance, but she's doing that with almost all of her nutrients. She's taking calcium from her bones to feed that calf. She's taking protein off her back to feed that calf. Late lactation, it's going to go the other way. She's going to put out less calories associated with the milk than she's taking in. And that we refer to that as positive energy balance. So if we're looking at our lactation, she's going to lose weight, body condition in the first part of lactation then she's going to gain it back. So we're in negative energy balance here, and then positive energy balance. Late lactation, we hopefully are flat through the dry period. We don't want to gain or lose weight during the body condition. We don't want to gain or lose body condition during the dry period. We want to gain weight. And what's that usually? Yeah. Calf is going to double and triple in size in those last two months. So we want her to gain weight, but we don't want her to change in body condition. So early lactation, she's producing milk with what she eats and what she pulls off her back. Late lactation, what she eats is going to put that condition back on and to milk production. So a lot of the livestock breeds, the meat animals, the um, chickens, the pigs, all beef talk about feed efficiency. How many pounds of gain do I get per pound, of gain, pound that I um, consume? So feed efficiency. If we look at our cows, we look at feed efficiency. Early lactation, she's going to put out maybe two pounds of milk for every pound she consumes. 
Now, this is higher than the marginal, the last intake. This is the average over everything. The first 10 megacalories go to keep her alive. The next 30 go to milk production. So the average milk production is higher than it is in late lactation. So that is a reflection of the energy balance. So early lactation, she's a negative energy balance where this milk is being produced by what she consumes plus what comes off her back. So when we're thinking about feed efficiency and early lactation, we're like, well, we're kind of cheating. We're not accounting for everything. We're talking about feed in, milk out, but we're not accounting for change in body condition. So losing that body condition makes her more efficient in early lactation, sending nutrients to um, body condition makes her less efficient in um, late lactation. So positive energy balance in late lactation intake is greater than the need when we think about milk production, and that's called anabolism, anabolism. So we're anabolic, we're trying, we're building up tissues, we're building up body condition. Everybody's heard of anabolic steroids. Those lead to more muscle, right? Baseball players who don't have necks anymore. Well, steroids, I'm not on steroids. <laughs> No, just just B12, Mr. McGuire. Um, catabolism, catabolic. We're taking, breaking down tissues, and we're helping them meet a need in early lactation. So she's a negative energy balance. Her intake and with our lactating carrot, dairy cows, there's no way we can meet the need. So if we're looking at milk production, what proportion of her intake from a milk production standpoint, where does most of the milk come from? Intake or body condition? Intake, so this whole area here, this might be five or 10 pounds at peak. Most of what she produces is related to what she eats. So we're looking at our metabolism. What's happening in these two states? The positive energy balance and the negative energy balance. Yes. Um good environment, making sure they get the resting time in, having a good balanced ration, high quality forages, um, no heat stress. So giving them a very comfortable environment, making the cow comfortable, making sure the cow is not stressed. You're not, we're not doing like they say they're doing with the geese. Burying them up into their necks and force feeding them. No, there's no way you can do that. I try to get a cow to lead is one thing. Try to force them to eat. I don't think that's possible. So we bred them with that desire to eat. We just have to allow them, create an environment that allows them to express that and not inhibit that. And we'll talk about that as we get to nerves. So what's happening in negative energy balance? We've got milk being produced by the feed she consumes and also off her back. So where is everything flowing? Where are the milk components coming from? Where's the fat coming from? Body, small intestines. So you're looking at You've got the gut producing a lot of that. Not, those arrows are not meant, it's just to be into milk. It's not specifically lactose. We're also pulling off the adipose and we're pulling off the muscle 
to provide all the components or things that we need for lactation. So everything she consumes in the diet, plus the fat she takes off her back, plus the muscle she takes off her back, or the protein. We're looking at positive energy. We're doing something a little bit different. So what goes in or what's in the blood gets divided into three sources to replenish that body condition. It goes up to adipose tissue. It goes to the milk or it goes to the muscle. So taking those things that we find in the blood, we're partitioning them into three directions. The balance tends to be, you know, how much BST she has got in her body, how much insulin she's got in her bar, body, where are the hormones set points. So as an aside here, this anybody knows this, anybody seen these before? DFA lab results. So this is what your access, you log in your DFA account. It has data pickup, um, ticket number, pickup ID, the weight associated with it, their measurements of everything. So you know what you're gonna get paid and not paid depending on what your pickup is. They have this area they've added a couple of years ago, and I still can't get a straight answer out of why, what numbers are good and what numbers are bad. But at least you can now, given what we've learned in class, understand what's going on here. So we have fatty acids, FA, FA, and FA, fatty acids. So they take a look at the milk fat. I'm not sure how they do this must be an indirect measurement, some kind of NIR measurement. They divide your fats into three categories. So we've got preformed fat, generally 20 carbons or longer. So greater than 20 carbons longer or longer. So that's preformed. So what does that mean? Where did that come from? The body or possibly muscle, where else? Diet, right? So body or diet. Over on the other side, we got de novo. Where do those come from? These are made in the mammary gland. They're generally less than 12 carbons long. The middle here, they've got the mixed. From 14 to 18, it's kind of hard to know where they came from. Did they come off the back or did they come and be made in the mammary gland? We don't know. So I'm like, okay, what are you giving us this information? What do we do with it? We've measured it. Now we'd like to manage with, with it. Best I can get is they suggest that if your de novo synthesis drops, maybe your cows aren't as happy as they could be. Maybe we've got a little bit of acidosis, a little tinge of milk fat depression that's leading to the shutting down of the mammary synthesis. But nobody can tell me is a 0.9 really all that much different than a 0.8. I've tried to find that information. I can't. But be aware of that. And I'm sure somebody's going to come out with a paper at some point to say what the benchmarks are for these three columns. I had to look at it. They add up to close to what the butter fat total is. So at some point, we'll figure all that out. Any questions on metabolism? Why don't we stop there, take our five minute break. We'll start again at 16 of, and we'll talk about the nervous system.
It brings me so mad. Plus, the soft sheet isn't that clear. No, I mean, I'm afraid of getting this fast. I'm ready to only work since. Yeah, I, I gotta give a uh, first thing after that. I gotta get a transfer call. I guess might be three. Oh, we lose the app. Yeah, you still want to milk tomorrow morning, or do you rather have a Saturday? Oh, I still be. Maybe I'm playing all of it. So, your brain. Sierra Nevada? Yeah. Uh, it's a retailer out in Nevada. Are you sure? It's yeah, not we'll see you at the end of the can. That's what I thought. I don't know. I think it's a. Hey, well, hey, look at this. This looks well. It's just right on. Oh, shit. Yeah. Well, yeah. Who knows? It might be the company logo or it might be the mountain range out in California. Well, the so, <laughs> well, I guess you don't have much choice of what it is, right? So, nervous system. What do we know about the nervous system? Anything? Signal. Signals. Signals. Uh, what's the speed on nervous system? Very fast. So, given our size, we're probably between us and elephants, probably about as big as you can go with the speed of nerve transmissions. You start to get too big, like we start to look at King Kong and all these things that are running around in these movies. It's like if they have nerves like ours, they're gonna move way slower because it takes so long for that signal to get there and back. So let's see what we can learn about the nervous system. So neurons are the cells of the nervous system. 
So they're, again, cells, just like the muscle cells that are present at birth, and we don't really have an opportunity to change the number of them. Um, and we're still learning how they we can teach them to fix themselves. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. So neurons, when we're looking at them broadly, from a distance, they'll have two parts. The body, which is going to have all the classic organelles in it. We need to generate energy. We need to generate proteins. We need to generate receptor compounds, all the classic organelles are gonna be there, the nucleus is gonna be there. And what separates neur neurons apart is these long extensions that go in many different directions. So classically, we have dendrites that are extensions that are going to receive the information, receive signals. Then these signals are processed along the way, usually in the body, but sometimes in the axons as well. Dendrites will take that signal, the nerve will decide, am I going to send a signal along the way or wasn't the yelling, the squeaking, the signal strong enough for me to continue to send it along. So axons tend to be longer and they're covered with a myelin sheath this insulates and also accelerates the speed at which um signals go on these axons and i don't fully understand how they jump but they they say they do so um somebody smarter than me will accept what they're doing there myelin sheaths are made up of almost perfectly fat, and we'll show you a picture of those in a minute. So these are examples of the nerves. The one we just described is so over here on D. If you go to the bookstore, sometimes they'll have stuffed animals of these. They look like little elephants sitting in the corner, usually in the nursing stuff, if they want to have a nerve cell. So you have the body of the nerve, and then you have dendrites collecting input from a number of different possible sources. Those inputs are summarized, we assume somewhere in the body, and then we've got one axon that can send a signal out. So collect all the information from the dendrites. Am I gonna fire or not? If I fire, I'm gonna send that signal down the axon, which may or may not be branched at the end. We have other sensory kind of neurons here where things are going in, things are coming out, maybe sidestepping the body. These are thought to be, I think they said more embryonic, not found in adult vertebrate nervous system. So more embryonic, things are just getting started, things are just getting organized. So yes. Um, it depends on the direction you're going, but they're either you don't have the nerve or the nerve is somehow disconnected. And we'll show you how the things are wired. So it might or may not be the axon. So, so this is, uh, that kind of that D look there. This is a little bit more detail. Again, we have the body of the cell. We got the nucleus there. We've got the, um, endoplasmic reticulum, you got the Golgi apparatus, you got the mitochondria, all the things you'd expect in the cell. We have all the dendrites are feeding into that body of the cell and nerves only go one way. So signal comes in, one side of the cell goes out the other. So we're usually going from dendrites to axons. You have these myelin sheets, these little white blobs that we're seeing here, a close-up of those, where we have a Schwann cell. Got the nucleus of there. It's basically a fat pancake that's wrapped around the nerve cell. So the fat acts as an insulator. Signals don't go through it. 
you've got all that fat there. And then the spaces between those cells, nodes of Renvier, node of Renvier. Is that French? Anybody here good at French? The Renvier. Renvier, Renvier. Signal tends to jump from one node to the next. That allows the signal to accelerate. I'm not really sure I understand that, but that's what they say. So signal propagates in one direction. We come in with the dendrites, out with the axon. The insulation here helps stop crosstalk, right? If you got exposed wires, the insulation is gone on the outside, bad things happen, right? We had some mice up in our attic nibbling on some wires. That was something we thankfully caught in time. So taking the insulation off. So um, a lot of this happens when you're in your single digits, the myelination, you're stretching out your nerves as you grow. We get that myelination occurring. So putting a kid on a high fat diet i.e. drink your milk is a good thing because we're forming these swan cells filling them up with fat and providing that insulation we have some misguided people that our kids should be on a low calorie um low fat diet their nerves don't get myelinated correctly and they start having short circuits which sometimes lead to seizures because they didn't have enough calories to do what needed to be done. So kids are growing, they're gonna need a whole lot more calories on a per body weight basis. So let's not short them out or let's not um, go kind of crazy with trying to keep them on a low calorie diet. Yes, sir. Curious if the uh, I don't know that one, so. I would imagine there's probably preferential fat in there because once it's there, I don't think it really goes anywhere. I guess if you really got to starvation, you might be able to take the fat out, but generally you don't want to. So, but that's just a guess on my part. So another um, illustration of the same thing, nerve cell, you've got an axon that's branched, might go in two different directions. You have multiple axons acting on another nerve, and that, based on the input from this one, this one, this nerve will decide, will I fire or not? So the information coming into the dendrites from other nerves will be totaled up, and they say, is this enough to send a signal or not? Another thing we deal with the sensory, and so we got that kind of body of the nerve on the ends uh, off the off to the side. You've got a receptor that, on some level, responds to stimulus. So we're talking about these in the nerve or sensory organs. So in this case, I think we're illustrating a pressure sensor that responds when that is squeezed. Ultimately, when we think about our um, environment, most of what we take in, at least most of our senses, except for smell, is pretty much vibration. Different wavelengths, vibrations going in the eyes, ears, touch, and how we understand or interpret those vibrations helps get us through the day. So, Depending on how much this receptor is squeezed, it may or may not fire and send a signal along to the central nervous system. So kind of a sensory neuron. We're looking at our nervous system. We're going to divide it into two parts. The central nervous system. We'll abbreviate it here today, CNS. and the peripheral nervous system, PNS. Different characteristics, but they're both gonna be necessary 
to get the job done. So we look at the central nervous system. There's a video there about two minutes long. Um, should be up there on your uh, bright space where they took a cow and they plasticized it and then sawed it in half so you can get a feel for where everything is. It sort of gives you a picture close to this. So this is a cow head sawed in half. You've got their brain is right here, or at least the top part of their brain. So you're looking at something the size of a fist, which kind of surprises me with their, how big their head is. They have only something the size of a fist in there. This might explain a lot, but you've got a lot of cavities, sinuses around that are going to, if they're button heads, it's going to help protect, help absorb shock. So, and then you've got the brain stem down here and the spinal cord leaves out the head, goes through our cervical vertebrae and on down the line. So when we're talking about euthanasia, we talked about getting that target between the eyes and the horn. You're trying to get that bolt or that bullet to get down to the brain stem. So if it gets to the brain stem, that animal should be instantly insensate, instantly dead. Um, so it's a question of where you're putting it between the eyes, it takes you right through here. You need to go up a little higher. Yes. I feel like that was What's missing there? The jaw. So you've got the jaw that's going to come down to about here. We're going over. So, well, maybe we should take a look at that video. See what it does to the. So. What we're seeing is only in that picture, only the upper half. So the jaw down here. So brain there, spinal cord coming out. So that skull we have doesn't have any of this stuff. So. Well, that side's not too bad. It's when they flip o flip it over, it gets a little creepy. So we have one of those up at the freezers of the dairy. We have heads up there, but not plasticized heads. These are you inject everything with plastic through the arteries and veins, and it should prevent it from rotting. Um, no, it's just similar to embalming. So you're replacing the blood with a preservative. In this case, you're replacing it with plastic. So, anybody seen what is it, Body Works, those exhibits where they have people and they've done that with people and then they take parts of the body away? Like they'll just have like the main arteries and arterioles standing there, no bones, no anything else. You can take a now. So yeah, right. that side's a little creepy. But yeah, I've seen those where they show like the things. So um, well, they donated the right side. Somebody donated, and when you get into that stuff, it gets pretty shady pretty quick as to who gave permission for this money making enterprise. So you donated your body to science. Did you want to be on display playing poker <laughs> with, you know, of uh, paying admission? So, so anybody here listens to Jolly and Oliver? He does a whole segment of where your body sometimes ends up when you donate it. So it's, I think so, but I think it depends on where you are. So. So, so that's a little close of uh, the brain case. Um, I'm not sure if this animal was shot or not, or it's just an old skull. 
So you've got the brain sitting in that spot, um, the top half there. So what are we looking at when we've got the brain here? You have the upper brain here for the central nervous system. You've got an olfactory bulb. You've got the lower brain down here. The PI down here is the pituitary. So we go from the nervous system to the endocrine system between the hypothalamus sits right above it, the pituitary size of a P underneath. Um, we transition from a nervous control to pituitary control. So we have this diagram here. We move that over. So brainstem, you're looking at things that we don't think too much about. So you've got uh, homeostatic control, coordinates brain movement or body movement. We get certain patterns, we encode them into the lower part of the brain, and we don't think about them too much. So like you get up in the morning, you're brushing your teeth, right? Your brain, upper brain kind of says, brush your teeth. You've got a pattern you go through, right? Front, back, sides, up, down, all the way around. We don't think about much that I need to take from one step to another. We've kind of encoded that. The same with walking. I want to go over there. Lower brain says, okay, to do that, I need to turn and walk. And there's a certain pattern of neurons firing to move the appropriate muscles in the appropriate directions. Yes. So you guys want the whole slide, right? You want this one. Okay, the code, the uh, letters are? Okay, so C is for cerebrum. So up here, the upper brain. O is for olfactory bulb. CP is our cerebral punduncle. P is the pons, part of the lower brain. CB, the cerebellum, part of the lower brain. Medulla oblongata, part of the lower brain. So everything here, brain stem, or sometimes we'll call it the lizard brain. Since you don't think, well, I don't know, I've never had a brain of a lizard out, but the cerebellum up top seems to be lacking in some of our reptiles. Like that scene. <laughs> there you go. So, figuring out which one's which. So, brainstem moves that around. Medulla oblongata controls breathing, circulation, swallowing, digestion. So, a lot of things you don't think about, which is why when we euthanize an animal, we need to get to that part there. If we don't go all the way in, there's a lot of spastic motion things that happen associated with that. So the things we don't think about, things that are under subconscious control, I don't have to remember to keep breathing because if it was up to me to remember breathing, I'd probably forget. Um, so pons controls the breathing. Midbrain receives and integrates data. So you've got stuff going up, stuff going down, directing things, moving things around in the midbrain. Cerebellum coordinates movements, learns and remembers motor, motor responses. So like, um, what is it? Uh, patterning. So how do I walk? So we've got, um, there were some cows that had uh, broken tails at the last place I worked. It was part of a defective rapid exit problem. And they walk kind of funny after that. And one has to think that maybe the nerves weren't working um, or connected as well as they might have been. So it looks like when they, that's what it looked like to me, when they started moving their front legs, their back legs felt that motion and started doing what they were supposed to. It wasn't particularly coordinated, but they knew there was a pattern they had to follow. If we're walking, this is what we're doing. So 
one would suggest to me that maybe things weren't as connected. So the hypothalamus is tucked up under here. There's no letter for that. Um, that's your, uh, basically, what communicates with the um, pituitary. There's a lot of good things going on there. Yes. What have to do with balance? I, I don't think it seems to. Docking tails didn't seem to influence things. Although when they're running, I think some of the postures they achieve will influence the position of their tail. But I don't think um, cows use their tails or horses use their tails for balance. No, what do tails do? <laughs> Hit you in the face, get a mouthful of whatever's on that tail, and it'll ruin your morning. Um, and yeah, if they're shaved, they're a hell of a club. So we had a grad student, she was walking behind one of our cows after we were tail bleeding, and she had a whole rack of um blood we just spent an hour collecting oh no and she took a shot to the face she went down to one knee but she did not drop it <laughs> we just went yeah. <laughs> that was amazing so i don't know where she is these days i think she's in dc but yeah she took that shot to the face but did not drop the last hour's work so cow probably got that you know every once in a while you get kicked by a cow and it's like yeah i deserve that so i think that was just not happy about being stuck for a tail bleed. So cerebellum, this is where we got the more sophisticated processes going on, memory, speech, learning, emotions, complex behavioral responses. So down lower, things that we don't have to think about, things that are kind of housekeeping. This is kind of where we think we're more superior to other animals um, because we have a increased cere cerebrum. So central nervous system, we're looking at the brain and the spinal cord. This is housed in what part of the skeleton? Brain cave. Nope. We're reaching back a month, maybe two. What part houses the central nervous system? Axial skeleton. So holds that. The central nervous system is responsible for integration. It's going to listen to all the inputs that are coming in. On some level, it's going to make a decision that's going to send a signal back out, a response to say what to do. So again, everything is one way. So you're going to have separate nerves coming up. Whatever happens in the brain, and then separate nerves going out. They're called afferent and efferent nerves. So afferent, afferent, come into the brain, efferent, go out. So if you look at the pattern, we know that there are certain nerves in certain locations. We're not going to worry about what they are. If you're going to vet school, you'll have to learn them all. But I don't think most of you are headed there, right? Or if you want to study them, that's fine. So we have specific nerves coming out between specific vertebrae. So you can start to count. OK, this one comes out at after the third thoracic. This one comes out in the middle of the lumbar. You can do that. So this is sort of why. We have a defined amount of thoracic vertebrae, defined amount of lumbar, defined amount of sacral, defined amount of cervical. We need to have the bones and the nerves coming out in a specific pattern. If we start messing with the numbers, well, then where's that nerve going to come from? How's it going to get out? So given our set numbers of each section of the spinal column, we have specific nerves coming out, atlas of bovine anatomy. So this is from the eighth edition of Anatomy and Physiology of Farm Animals. 
This is from the Atlas of Bovine Anatomy. So a uh, vet who's a very good artist. has got a good side income. So looking in there, you're going to have the same patterns coming out in between the vertebrae. Specific nerves come out from specific locations. So and then what we're looking at here is axons coming out. And we'll talk more about that organization in a minute, but you've got that long axon going down. You have multiple axons coming out for different muscles. Every nerve cell, every nerve or muscle fiber has got its own nerve cell or nerve connection. The peripheral nervous system, everything outside the skull and the vertebrae, outside the axial skeleton. These are the communication lines between the parts of the body and the central nervous system. So hands, I've got nerves in there that are gonna send signals up into my central nervous system that said, you're fidgeting too much, Mooney, stop it. So whatever it is, you have a sensory or afferent side. This is gonna collect information to send to the central nervous system. You've got a motor or efferent side that's going to send out commands. So afferent comes into the central nervous system, efferent comes out. So I remember that A becomes before E. So what do we know about, does everybody know what this is? Venn diagram. So if we're looking at the central and peripheral nervous systems, how are they the same? They're both part of the nervous system. They both have nerves. What are the differences? Central nervous system, how is it different? Inside the skull, inside the column, outside the skull. You've got kind of an integration side, and then you've got receiving signals and sending signals with the peripheral nervous system. So you can play with that as you move forward. So this is from Mr. Dr. Day. He's, he's retired, but I stole this when I started this class. This is a nice diagram that shows the flow of information through the nervous system. So we start over here. We have sensory nerves. They're going to either sense what's going on inside our body or what's going on around us. So five senses help us here. And then we got all the nerves associated with how our heart and lungs and guts and bones and all those things go up. So this is the afferent side. It's coming up the peripheral nervous system. It goes up into the central nervous system, then comes back down to the peripheral nervous system and goes out the efferent nerves, which are called motor nerves, which divide into two different types. We have the voluntary, which go to our somatic muscles, does anybody want to guess which muscle type this is? Skeletal, Skeletal muscle versus smooth or cardiac muscle. So we have the voluntary versus involuntary. And then we divide the involuntary into sympathetic responses and parasympathetic responses. The only real problem with this diagram is if you look at it, you might imply that there's a circle going on here. There's not. You can come up one side of the central nervous system, come back down. You can't do this through here. So that's probably the only drawback to this diagram. Central nervous system will take the hypothalamus and feed into the endocrine system. We'll talk about that next week. 
You're going up one side and coming down the other. You're not crossing from the down back to the up side. So if you're probably doing this, what you probably should do is take this out, knowing that everything down here is the PNS. You go up this way, and then you come down separately on this side. So flow of information in the nervous system is one direction. And it's not, a, ultimately, it's not a closed loop. You go up, down, there. The nerves do not talk to each other, but they can um, produce actions, produce responses that in turn, the sensory things can see or taste or touch or whatever to feed the system again. But it's a you. You go, you, action happens, sensory nerves figure out what's going on, send it through again. So sensory or afferent, we have the internal. What am I doing? How fast is my heart going? How fast am I breathing? How's my gut working? Do I feel pain? As we get older, certainly some interesting pains start to show up for no apparent reason. It's not the age, it's the mileage, right? External, what's going on around me, outside my body? This is where the five senses come in. Trying to get a feel for what's going on in the world around me. So that's the sensory side. We move over to the motor side or the efferent. We said we separate it to voluntary and involuntary. Sometimes called the somatic for the voluntary. As we said, this controls the skeletal muscle and generally is involved with all the things we have to think about. I want to go over there. I want to sit in that chair. I need to go get lunch. Moving around, I need to brush my teeth. Involuntary, sometimes called autonomic, controls the smooth muscles and organs, and it's the stuff we don't think about. So autonomic, automatic, versus somatic of the body. So that you were talking about, we have sensory input, it goes into the central nervous system, the green arrow, and then we have motor output. Now, depending on where you are, depending on what you're doing, there are sensors that might say, okay, my leg's in a funny position, or I'm tilting over, or we're moving too fast. That's going to not be a continuous cycle, but be sensed there, and we keep that you going. Input, integration, output. So reflexes are the shortest route through the nervous system. So you've got automatic reflexes. They're going to enter on the dorsal side of the spinal column, afferent. They're only going to be in that central nervous system for just a tiny bit. And they're going to send out a signal through the ventral part. So these are usually high, high hardwired and they're mostly peripheral nervous. They're just a little bit. They're in the spinal cord and then they're back out. So reflexes, we think a lot about the stretch reflexes. So if I've got a stretch receptor, stretch receptor in a muscle that gives me a feel for how long or is my muscle contracted or is it being stretched out? Say I have a muscle being stretched out, that receptor will fire. It'll go up into the spinal cord. We've got the peripheral body there. We've got one synapse and then we're back to the muscle and it's going to tell the muscle to contract. 
the fight being stretched. So these happen millions of times a second when we're standing up. So our body, if we start to tilt one way, the muscle reflexes pull it back. We go the other way, muscle reflexes go back. So they kind of keep us where we are. That's why when we get drunk, things start moving a little bit harder and a little bit farther. So we also have an opportunity for branching coming in from this receptor. So we've got the reflex going here, basically two nerves involved, but we've also got a branch point that's gonna send it to where? The brain. So if you touch a hot stove, what usually happens? Move your hand before you even think you've done it, right? Your hand's back and you're going, what the hell did I do that for? Then you feel the pain. So that's that junction point here where we need you to get out of trouble. We're going to send that signal here. Oh, by the way, we'll let the brain know what's going on. So our hand has moved before we even know what's going on. So what's the advantage of a reflex? Don't get very far. It's as fast as it can be, right? There's very little committee work. There's no discussion. Just bam, right? Your hand comes back. Your body gets things done. And then it may at some point let your brain know what just happened. So that's going to take, if you're doing your hand, you're going to spinal cord and back versus you got to go all the way up and back to figure out what happened. So the classic stretch is the, the knee test. So what are they doing there? Has anybody had that hammer on your? Yeah, I've got a tendon that's so tight, I almost kicked the doctor in the face. <laughs> so you hit it with a hammer, what does that do? You've got the tendon here that goes through your kneecap. It's gonna pull on that muscle. So the reaction or reflex is to shorten that muscle back up. That's why we kick. So if our reflexes are working, our spinal cord is doing what it's supposed to, we will send a signal back to tighten this one, inhibit this one, and we do that kick. So we'll start there next time. Continue our discussion of the brain. Well, we still got one more to go in theory, so.